Hey, you guys doing okay out there? Hey, I, I really missed you guys last week. Um, I took Mike Williams up with me to warm, sunny Grafton, Wisconsin. <laughs> I was preaching at Cornerstone Church up there. Great, great church, great group of people. Pastor Joe is coming off of his sabbatical, and uh, he's getting back in the saddle. So I was there, I think just one of the last guys, just helping him with that. But I'm so glad to be back home. And didn't Pastor Larry do a wonderful job last week? <laughs> Woo! That's what I love about uh, being able to watch the service on demand. It's really great. And I just also want to greet our, our online congregants and parishioners as well. We're so happy that you're here. So um, the next couple weeks are going to be sort of a different. We're just going to do a little mini-series called Raising the Dead. And today we're going to talk about raising our awareness. This whole message series is really a heart preparation for us as believers to prepare our hearts for reaching out to others. Because we live in a very traditional area, can you say amen? And Easter and Christmas is a big time for people to actually come to church. It may be the only time that they come uh, through the entire year. So we really want to pray in the Spirit to leverage that and to help them make that connection with God. We don't want them to walk away from Easter having just checked off a box, okay, I did that, I'm, I'm socially acceptable or whatever. We really want them to come and come into the presence of God leading up to Easter. And so that's what this series is all about. It's raising the dead, and we're not talking about the lost, we're talking about us. I'm talking about me. My heart needs revival. I'm desiring to be closer to God during this season. So I'm going to share some things with you. I think that it's really going to help you. Um, getting into this uh, message series, I just want to say this. Um, this is a series, I would say, again, for believers. But if, if you're here or if you're watching and you would say, you would say Mike, you know, I don't really profess Christ. I, I don't know a lot about Christianity. I wasn't raised in a church. I'm just trying to figure this whole God thing out. We want to invite you to listen in as well. I think you're going to get some things out of it. But I want to talk a little bit about our B.C. days. If you're a believer, a B.C. days are before Christ days. And how wayward we all were. And how much we needed a Savior. And I don't have to look any farther than my own self to know how badly I needed God. Now, the Lord showed Himself to me, and what I mean by that, I heard the gospel really for the first time at age 13, and I responded to it. But by 13, I'd done enough bad stuff to know that I needed a Savior. I had sinned plenty. No one had to convince me that I hadn't, hadn't sinned. I, I knew all my sins. I knew when I was doing wrong because I had to kind of press my conscience down. But I could always hear my mom and dad's voice in my head. And I remember... And I'll, I'll share this with you. I was hanging out with some older kids, and we were driving around Milwaukee. I was about, I was just 12 at this time, 13 actually. And, um, and they started smoking pot in the car. And I, I hadn't been exposed to that. I didn't ask to be in a car with that. But that whole car filled up with a cloud. And you can only hold your breath so long. And I'm sitting there like, what am I going to do? And Because we were living out in Cedarburg, you know, we're down in Milwaukee. And, I, and so I'm like, you know, just like this. But after a while, I was just kind of doing this. <laughs> and then I, I, I didn't know this was a symptom. I started getting really paranoid. <laughs> we're down in Milwaukee. Is that my mom and dad on the corner? You know, and I was, I was just losing it. And I'm like, oh, oh my word, this is not good. And then every police car I saw, I, I thought I, w I could just see myself on a lineup, you know, you know. I saw it all. And that's the only exposure I needed to that to say, you know what, I don't know what they, what they see in that, but I, I would never do that on my own. And I, I got home safe and everything, and I was probably reeking my parents you know, they, they somehow I escaped notice, and I'm eating in the kitchen, just, I'm like, God, why am I so hungry? It was terrible. 
And I just stayed out of the way. I went to bed and got up the next day. I was like, man, that's on the never again list. Within a few months, I actually heard the gospel. And I said, yeah, that, that's what I'm doing. That's the direction I'm heading in my, because I need that. But we've, we've all got things like that, right? From our BC days that you, you would just, oh, Lord. It's, it's, really, it's really the grace of God. You know, Paul describes what we were like. And I want to unpack this verse with you, and then we're going to just make some application to it. So in Ephesians chapter 2, um, we read this. And this is to believers again. He says, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses. That's important to understand. We were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked. So we're, he's looking back now. According to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. We're seeing that. Among whom... Also, we all, everyone say all. Okay, all means all. That's right. In whom we also, we all once conducted ourselves, here it is, in the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. That's the description of who we are and were as unbelievers. And so if you're here today and you're trusting in Christ for salvation, you've turned away from your own works, trying to be good enough to get into heaven. I call them 51% Christians. You know, I hope you know 51% is more good than bad and I get in, that type of attitude. This is the way we all were. And now we're looking on the other side of this. So everything that I'm going to described to you and talked to you about was true of you and me before we were in Christ. And so the first thing I want you to write down is this. Apart from Christ, people are dead in sin. Apart from Christ, people are dead in sin. The first verse of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 reads this. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. We were all dead. And before Christ, we needed to be made alive again. We were out. And dead in sin means we were dead to the things of God. It's not like the princess bride, like that mostly dead thing. No, we were dead, dead. We needed God. We weren't just ignorant. We were just oblivious to the things of God. You know, last week, and the week prior to that too, Michelle and I got some tough news. Her, one of her aunts passed away. And Aunt Joanne was a wonderful person, and, and we loved her and enjoyed being with her. We have assurance that she's with the Lord today. And then that same week, I found out one of my good friends, who is just a few years older than me, passed away. Very close to him. We marched in drum and bugle corps together. I stood next to him in the snare line for two years, so you get to know a person really well. When I moved out to California, a year later, he moved out, and then we were roommates. And so he's gone now. And I found myself all last week just thinking about him and quite honestly wondering, wondering where he is today. I shared my faith with him, but I don't have an assurance that he actually turned to the Lord and asked the Lord to forgive him and began trusting him to be in heaven. I don't know that for sure. I'll know it one day. And so, with these funerals and kind of with that news, it just got me to be thinking, and many of us have been to funerals, especially a, a funeral with an, with an open casket, and we see, we see a loved one there, but that's really not them, is it? It's, it's a shell, that's dead. The spirit is gone. The life is gone. The personality, the, just the, the life and the light in their eyes, it's gone. And there's nothing left except that. That's really what it's like to be dead in sin and trespasses. Here's the second thing I want you to write down. 
Apart from Christ, people are deceived. Apart from Christ, people are deceived. And I want you to see this in verse 2. It says, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. Now imagine that the whole world is under the sway of the enemy right now. This is a deceived state. This is thinking we're okay when we're really not. This is assuming we have life when we're really dead. It's deception. We have, we have no idea. You see, living in sin comes naturally because it's who we are when we're born. And your family, your unsaved family, your unsaved friends, this is where they're at. They're bowing down to the wrong God. Not even aware that they're serving someone other than the living God. You see, sin and rebellion are toxic. Do you guys know that death is 100% fatal? <laughs> I don't know if you've ever thought about that before. You know, in Genesis chapter 6, verse 3, we read this. Then the Lord said, My spirit will not put up with humans for such a long time, for they are only mortal flesh. In the future, their normal lifespan will be no more than 120 years. There's an individual alive today by the name of Cain Tanaka. And Cain Tanaka was born in Fukuoka, Japan on January 2nd, 1903. This past January, Cain turned 119 years old. Now my thought, if I'm Cain, Man, old Cain may only have nine more months to be around. <laughs> I better kind of get things in alignment, make sure I'm right with God before my departure. And that's the attitude that we have to have. None of us is going to be around forever. And the question I would ask you today and your loved ones and those that are watching, where are you going to be? 256 years from today. Where will you be? Do you know where you'll be? And so here's the third thing I want you to write down. And this, this sounds harsh, but it's really true. Apart from Christ, people are under judgment. Apart from Christ, people are under judgment. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3, we read this. Among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Not just physical death, but spiritual death. Under the judgment, the righteous judgment of God. We're born already judged because of the sin of our parents and our parents' parents going all the way back to our first parents, Adam and Eve. And the judgment resides over all of those who have not placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And unless judgment is reversed, it will result in spiritual separation for eternity. And that's sobering, folks, because this life is so short. You see, in John chapter 3, we read this. 
the Father loves the Son, he's talking about Jesus, and has given all things into his hand. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. And he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides or lives on him. That's the reality. That's the truth. This isn't complicated. We're either trusting in Christ to remove the wrath and judgment of God that we all deserve, or if we're not trusting in Him, it remains on us. Christ is the only remedy to be found. Or maybe a person is trusting someone or some other thing other than Christ. Listen, Jesus was very, very definite about it. He said, you cannot come to the Father apart from me. He's the gate. He's the only way to get to God. And it's a frightening thought to be under the judgment and the wrath of the Almighty God. And if you have family who are apart from Christ, if you have friends who don't know Christ, if you have co-workers that you know aren't living for God. It's as though they're in a car going a hundred miles an hour towards a bridge that's out and there's no signs other than you and me standing in the road trying to slow them down, trying to stop them, trying to divert them. I know that's a harsh picture, but that's the reality of it. People speeding along in life as though they've got forever to live and not worried about the outcome, not worried about where they're headed, not worried about whether they're right with God. That's the reality for all those who are apart from Christ. And so a resurrection church needs to take place. But it's really got to start with us. It's got to start with our hearts. It's got to start with my heart. And there's some things about our lives that we just have to make right. And I've just found in my life that whenever there's a time frame involved, it gets me focused. And so the time frame that I want to propose for us is two weeks. Two weeks just to really focus in, first and foremost, on ourselves. And then secondly, on the others that are apart from Christ. And so a resurrection needs to take place. And here's what I want you to write down, is my heart must be sensitized to the lost. My heart must be sensitized to the lost. Sometimes I ask myself, Mike, do you have a pulse? <laughs> I mean, I can be watching a show, and then one of those commercials comes on, you know, the ones where they show the, the abused animals, you know, the puppies and the kittens, you know, in slow motion with the violin music. And I'm telling you, I, you know, I look at it, I'm like, where's the remote? Just mute, you know. I mean, I just, I'm just like, brother, are you, you know? <laughs> My heart needs to be sensitized. I don't want to be known as the only living heart donor. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I want to have a heart. I want, and you want, to be in alignment with the heart of God. To be sensitized and aware of the lost. I'm, I'm sorry for the puppies and the kittens and, and everything else. But what about the people? What about the people? You know, one of the ministries that, that we wholeheartedly get behind, all, all, of our, all of our missionaries and ministries we support are class A people and organizations. I, I, would not, I would not invest your giving in anywhere that was not 
bringing a spiritual return, if you know what I'm saying. And Redeem and Restore is a wonderful ministry that helps women who are coming out of sexual trafficking and abuse, helping them get back on their feet again, loving them, caring about them, being patient with them, and helping them get back on their feet. That, that moves my heart. Because I know that these are people that apart from Christ, they can live in a terrible life and then still end up in hell. And so, it's important to be sensitized and understanding. So we have to ask, are my emotions in alignment with God? Is my heart connected to His? Is it beating in rhythm with His for the lost? You know, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 tells us this. The Lord is not slow about His promise, as some count slowness. He's talking about the promise to return back. But is patient toward you, not willing for any to perish, but for, say it with me, all to come to repentance. He wants to see everyone come to repentance. And the way He does that is through you, and through me, through letting our light so shine before men and women that they see our good works and they glorify our Father in heaven. That's God's plan. And so we want to be in alignment with that because God's desire is to see everybody come to repentance. And I'll be honest, I've heard some, some hardened Christians, not everybody, but some hardened Christians hide behind doctrines to excuse themselves of the responsibility to love people into the kingdom of God. You know, well, hey, I don't know that, I don't think they're the elect. They ain't getting in. Come on now. I'm just saying, I've heard that. Just excusing themselves from all liability. And that's not where God's heart is. We're plan A. There is no plan B. And in two weeks, there will be people sitting in these chairs one time, one time. Well, I'll give you one shot. And we've got to be praying and asking the Lord to show mercy on them and have them come to faith in Jesus Christ. You know, the heart of God is a shepherd. He loves people. He loves the 99. I love the 99. But as long as there's one out there, we've still got to go out and bring them in. You know what I'm saying? You know, if, if you're a dad here and you, you've got kids, you know, if your house was burning down and you and your wife are standing out there and you know your kids are still in there and the battalion chief comes out and you ask, how many, how many did you get out? And he says, I got two kids out. You don't say, oh, two out of three, that's not too bad. That's 66%. No! As a dad, you're running in there to go get that last child out. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's that real. So our hearts have to be sensitized to the lost because they're going in the wrong direction. Can you say amen? Here's the next thing I want you to write down. My mind must be alerted to the lost. My mind must be alerted. And I, and I want you to write something else down as well. Write this down. God will offend your mind to reveal your heart. You will see things and you will hear things that will offend your mind because he wants to do a heart check on you. You know, the Apostle Paul, who went through so much to faithfully pass on the gospel to our generation, had many opportunities to share his faith. And in his travels, it took him to Athens, Greece, which was the seat of knowledge and learning and understanding, democracy, many good things in the ancient world. 
And some men had heard him preaching, and they said, we want to hear a little bit more about this. So they brought Paul into what was called the Areopagus. And it was a structure set apart for people to exchange new ideas. Because that's what these people did. They were thinkers. And so Paul shared his faith. He shared his heart. He shared his experience. And then he said this, and I find this very, very interesting. He said, he's talking about past times. He said, truly, these times of ignorance, these past days, God overlooked. But now commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He's talking about Jesus Christ. Everyone will stand before him in judgment. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. It was the one sign that polarizes people. It says, And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. Oh, pfft, come on. Come on. While others said, We will hear you again on this matter. So why did God raise Jesus from the dead? Why did he do that? And I believe one of the reasons is this. Because a man that is raised from the dead, that experience will repel the proud, but will draw the fair-minded. A resurrection from the dead can repel the proud, but draw the fair-minded. I have a friend from Baton Rouge. His name is Paul. Him and his wife served on the mission field for many, many years. And they were deep in the interior of Mexico and they were up in the mountains reaching villages that no one else was going to. In fact, you could only reach these villages by horseback. It's the only way to get up there. And one of the hallmarks of this particular ministry was... God would raise the dead through them. On average, they saw one person a month raised from the dead. And Paul was telling me they went into this remote village way up in the mountains. And when they got there, there was nobody around. It was was like strange. And then they realized most of them were in and around a house. And so they got off their horses... And they came up, the doors were open, the windows were open, and it was a funeral. And it was a woman who had died, and she was laid out on the kitchen table, and they were having a funeral service, and and people were weeping and crying. And Paul told me, when they turned and they saw who they were, they walked in, they walked up to that corpse and they laid hands on that woman and prayed in the name of Jesus of Nazareth by the power of the Holy Spirit, I command you to rise. And the woman on the table went and sat up. And he said, all of the villagers screamed. They were running out the door. They were diving out the windows in fear, and they ran and hid in the mountains for a day and a half. And when they started trickling back in, this woman who was raised from the dead was perfectly healthy, and she shared her story that she said she was in a blackness, and suddenly this light appeared And it was this man standing in front of her who was in shiny clothes and in light. And he said, 
you have to go back and return. And she said, that's, that's when I, I was sitting up on this kitchen table. And Paul said, we began preaching Jesus Christ risen from the dead, the one who has power over Satan, the one who has power over sin and death, the one who is greater, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the Lord of all life. He said, is here, has sent us here to tell you, you don't have to spend an eternity apart from God. And when he asked, how many of you want to follow Jesus? The whole village. Because of the testimony of what they saw. Now I'm sure there's some here and there's some that are watching. When I just told that story, you went, mm, I don't know. But there were others who were thinking, I want to hear more stories like that. I know this man. He's a very godly man. He, he doesn't make stuff up. He was telling the truth. And so, we really do have to have our minds transformed and understand that life is more than we know. And God wants to do things through you and through me in the next two weeks to change our hearts and our minds. And here's, here's the third thing I want you to write down, and this is important. Our wills must be engaged for the lost. Our wills have to be engaged for the lost. It's not just enough to feel right. It's not just enough to think right. We also have to do what is right as well. Holy Week is coming up. It starts with Palm Sunday, which is next Sunday, and it ends on Easter Sunday. I was so blessed. I got an email in my email box from Pastor Denny and Mary. They lead our intercessory prayer team. And they took the initiative to say that we're going to pray the entire week. And different people on the team said, hey, I will take this day to fast and to pray for Easter Sunday. And I took a day. I took Wednesday. And I appreciate that the intercessors are doing this. But can I make an appeal to this congregation and to those that are watching? Would you consider praying all of that week from the 10th to the 17th for the lost? Will you consider maybe setting aside some things that are good and normal? Maybe, maybe it could be food, but maybe it's something else. Maybe it's you know watching TV or maybe it's listening to media or getting off of social media, just setting something aside. For those of you who are part of our congregation, we do 21 days of prayer and fasting at the front end of every year. It's kind of a little bit like that, but we're just asking you to just take a day and set it aside for God to be praying for those services. And not just praying, also doing. I want to challenge you. Don't just invite somebody to Easter Sunday, bring them. Bring them. I'm talking to like, pull up in front of their house, pick them up if you need to. Right? Invite them out to lunch. Tell them you don't want to miss it. I won't let you down. I won't let you down. For those of you that have been here for a while, you know that at the end of every service, I always give an invitation to act on what was said. And today I'm going to give two invitations. 
The first one is going to be for us as believers. That God would touch our hearts. That when He's asking us to respond to what I've said, we don't just mute, look down. This will be over in about two minutes. Okay, my show's back on. I'm going to ask God to touch our minds so that we can renew our thinking and see life differently for the next two weeks. And then I'm going to ask God to bend our wills. One of the greatest revivals in all of history was the Welsh Revival. And it began because some teenagers and some young adults prayed and they said, bend us, O God. Bend our will to conform to yours. He's not desiring that anybody perish, but that all come to repentance. I'm going to ask God to do that for us. And then I'm going to give an invitation if you've never made a commitment to Christ that's real and life-changing to take that step of faith today. Let's all bow our heads. Well, Father, I I just present to You this wonderful group of gathered people. The people that are here. The people that are watching. the people that You've drawn by Your Holy Spirit. Father, we don't want to be hardened in any way. God, we want to be sensitive to You. Who You are. To what You want to do in our lives and how You want to use us. Father, we pray that You would soften our hearts. Soften our hearts to our families. Soften our hearts to our friends, to our co-workers. God, renew our thinking. Let us understand the urgency of the days that we live in. That none of us is guaranteed tomorrow Father, we pray that You would bend us, bend our wills, God. Let us be conformed to the image of Christ who gave His all. God, we ask that You would do this in each and every believer here by the power of Your Holy Spirit right now in Jesus' name. That's it. Thank you, Father. Thank you, God. Sweep across this auditorium, God. Fill this place, God. With your presence. Fill it, God, with conviction and the power of the Holy Spirit. We thank you today, Father, for using us in the next two weeks. God, we say, here am I. Send me. God, I'll invite them. I'll bring them. I'll get over my fear of rejection. And I'll ask them to come be with me. And I thank you, Father, in advance of seeing it, God, that we are going to see many, 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 many people come to faith in Jesus Christ on Easter Sunday. And not just Easter Sunday, God, but all the days following. We 
It's just the day that we celebrate life and resurrection. And so I want to finish right now for those of you that are watching online and for those of you that are here. If you're here today and you would say, Mike, I know that I need to make a connection with God. I know that I need to say yes to Jesus Christ. Ask Him to forgive me of my past. Forgive me of my sin and my failure. To come into my life and give me a brand new heart, a brand new life, a fresh start. I want to pray for you. If you're here today and you want to say yes to God, you want to be included in in a very simple prayer to see that happen. Would you just let the Lord know that? I'm not going to ask you to come forward here today. I'm not going to ask you to stand up, but I do want you to just lift up your hand so that I can see it. If you would say yes, include me in on that prayer. I'm ready to make that commitment. Yes, God bless you. Are there others? Yes, God bless you. Are there others? You would say yes, I'm in. Just want to wait a moment. Or if you need to recommit your life to Christ and say yes to Him all over again, I want to pray for you too. And if you're at home watching this, just lift up your hand. Lift up your hand because the Lord is seen. God bless you. All right, let's pray together right now. And I want us all to pray in agreement for those that are saying yes to Christ today or yes for the hundredth time. It doesn't matter can come back to Him. Just pray with me. Say this, Lord Jesus. Oh, let's all say it out loud. Lord Jesus, I thank You today that You died for me. Forgive me of my sin. I give my life to You. Take control of my life. Holy Spirit, Teach me who Jesus is. Reveal the Father to me. and Help me to walk with Him. Thank You for putting Your arms around me. Loving me. Accepting me. And bringing me into Your family. I love You today, God. And I'm all in for You. Because I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Come on, let's give those who just prayed that prayer a big shout out.